Now that we've reached the end of Star Trek Discovery Season 3, the biggest question is, how was there a Star Trek Discovery Season 3? It's almost impossible to properly review an entire season of Star Trek Discovery in a timely manner. Yes, there is the infinite amount of plot holes. There is the contrived and vapid storytelling. Signature, Alex Kurtzman. But this year, we added something new. Crying. Lots of and lots of crying. Star Trek Discovery is a perfect failure. You have to try this hard to be this bad. The only reason there isn't a giant public outcry about this show is because nobody's watching it. Alex Kurtzman is a disciple of the Destroyer franchises, Jar Jar Abrams, and he has learned well. We are 41 episodes into Kurtzman Trek, and I would challenge anyone to point out a classic moment, much less a classic episode. Star Trek Discovery Season 3 doesn't have the budget of Season 1, the better cast of Season 2 that only served as a distraction. We are condensed to the core elements of what makes this show awful. So buckle up, kids. We're going to talk about some of the worst television ever produced that most of you thankfully haven't seen. It's made of our shits, you know. Nerderotic.com. The only thing this season of Kurtzman Trek accomplished was putting an expiration date on Star Trek, if you count this as canon. We see the end of the Romulan and Vulcan story. We see the end of the Mirror Universe, and we see the end of the Federation. Both Doctor Who and Star Trek are on parallel paths. Both used to be lightly entertaining and insightful TV shows. Now they are platforms for influence. Um, the goal is not really to promote Star Trek, but to promote these organizations and to use our platform. Yum, yum. The only problem with being a platform for influence is you actually have to have people to influence, which this show doesn't. Make no mistake, this is the Michael Burnham show, and this has been a problem with Star Trek Discovery from the start. Their main character is unlikable. She's a sociopath. She's pretentious. She's breathy. And she is the very definition of a Mary Sue on the hero's journey. We have Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. Then we have Michael Burnham's Hero's journey, which is, you should have listened to Michael Burnham all along. And they have dialed up the space Jesus to infinity this season. She has to be involved in every minute decision, every away mission. The one episode where they don't have a Michael Burnham, they end up talking about Michael Burnham. Considering that I don't want to make a video and I doubt you want to sit through one that's three hours long because that's what it would take to point out every stupid thing in this show it is really that dumb we are going to use an aid we are going to use a website that this show is made for polygon whoops star trek discovery season three failed its characters and its plots well i'll defend it here you can't fail something you don't have there are no characters that any human being could connect with in any way this show does try to introduce storylines and issues that are way beyond the pay grade of this writing staff which just end up being situations michael burnham can easily solve and then have a good cry about the Discovery and Michael Burnham in her magic time-traveling Iron Man suit are shot 930 years into the future to free Alex Kurtzman and Michelle Paradise of established canon. You might ask yourself, why would you take on an established franchise with an established fan base with an established canon and want to free yourself from that? Is it because you want that audience, but you don't want to put the work in to make the show for that audience? The answer is yes. Now, why did the Discovery have to go 930 years in the future? It's very difficult to explain that briefly, but I will do my very best. In Star Trek Discovery Season 2, the Discovery downloaded 100,000 years worth of data from a magic sphere that floats through the universe and records things. This information is vital to a Federation computer called Control that in the future will become an evil artificial intelligence that will destroy all organic life. This message came through the Red Angel and a dyslexic Spock. I like science. Dyslexic Spock, Captain Pike, and the crew of the Discovery decide that the only way to save the Discovery, which has merged with the Sphere data, is to send it 930 years in the future with the help of the magic bullshit Iron Man Red Angel suit. So Michael, in her Red Angel suit, right after her mother, whose name is Gabriel, in her Red Angel suit... Oh! 
does number two work for? Saved all organic life in the universe from Control, who is portrayed as toxic masculinity. Women, stop talking. The only problem with this entire storyline is they defeated Control so it wouldn't exist in the future, so they didn't need to go at all. Leland is dead. Control is neutralized. But they did anyway. Oh. That's right, buddy. You show that turd who's boss. This brings us to season three, where Michael Burnham bumps into her future boyfriend in space. That's right. We have a can opener chasing a giant piece of metal that's piloted by Book, which should sound familiar because these creatively bankrupt writers can't think of anything themselves, so it reminds you of another character from a better show. Book is a non-threatening male character of color with a big fluffy cat named Grudge, and he's an empath who can talk to plants and animals. Both Book and Space Jesus fall from space onto the planet and survive. Space Jesus congratulates herself after saving all organic life in the universe, then sends her time-traveling magic Iron Man suit back through the wormhole on autopilot. Think about it just for a second. That's right, the magic time-traveling Iron Man suit had an autopilot. So does the Discovery, but we're not going to dwell on such things because the writer's room isn't. Michael Burnham eventually meets her girlfriend, Book, who tells her something happened called The Burn 120 years prior to Michael Burnham's arrival. The, all the dilithium crystal in the galaxy, in the universe, we're not really clear, explodes all at once, decimating the Federation and the Quadrant. That's right, a show with the acronym STD's big overarching plot for season three is called the burn. <laughs> you serious? Discovery had the potential to live up to Star Trek's classic mission of providing perspective and commentary on the biggest issues of the day. Yet for every topic the writers tried to tackle, the conclusion was muddled or perfunctionary rather than actually insightful. The main arcs were also rushed since two of the season's 13 episodes were entirely devoted to setting up a spinoff for a show that probably won't happen, Section 31. The result was an extremely weak season that didn't deliver satisfying arcs for most of the show's characters. The writers introduced complex plots... <laughs> no, plot contrivances. Then wrap them up with feel-good simplicity. Polygon breaks Star Trek Discovery down to three major plot contrivances. Gender identity, mental health, and resource scarcity. Paramount would grab a lot of attention in 2020 with the announcement that season three of Discovery would feature the series' first major trans and non-binary characters, Gray and Adira. Adira is another one of our new characters who is a human host to a Trill symbiote that used to belong to her dead boyfriend. A dead boyfriend that Adira can still see but nobody else can. The idea of a Trill symbiote being in a very young human host is never really explored, and it's just used so she can complain about her ghost boyfriend. Back to Polygon, but the biggest problem is that both characters are just used as accessories for the relationship between Stamets and his boyfriend, ship physician Hugh Culber. The fact that I'm agreeing with Polygon on anything should tell you how bad this show really is. What Polygon calls a failed study in gender identity, I would call a completely successful virtue signal throughout the entire season all of the members of the alphabet community interact with each other separate from the rest of the crew completely antithetical with anything that star trek has done before because of the inability of the writing staff to tell complex stories or tell stories at all but this did bring about the standout scene of star trek discovery season three adira correcting Paul Stamets on her pronouns. I reviewed every individual episode in detail, and that's why I'm not going to go into that much here, but I did have a bit of a meltdown on my review for this show because of the pronouns. If somebody actually wanted to correct me on pronouns and they asked nicely, fine, but I can tell you right now, I'm 51 years old and I've come across that situation exactly zero times. My wife is a hairdresser. I have been to fashion shows. I worked in LA for two years. I've been to 
too many cons to count. And I have never come across that situation. I served the public in San Francisco selling comic books for 10 years. And I came across that situation exactly zero times. It's only used to weaponize language. We saw what happened to Gina Carano. That's what Star Trek is perpetuating right now. There's also the fact that it's the 31st century and Star Trek has already established that it's well past these constructs. And as far as writing is concerned, and I'm not even a writer, but I know you don't want to refer to your characters as a he or a she. You want to refer to them as much as possible by their name so the viewer or reader remembers it. That also solves the pronoun problem. And if you want to feel special, don't be an insipid, insecure asshole and go on Twitter and try to cancel people over language. Back to Polygon, one of the other A or B plots was supposed to be coping with trauma and the burden of leadership. Well, I had a lot of trauma watching this show, and I can imagine it must be traumatic being a leader with Michael Burnham constantly disobeying your orders and making Saru look like an idiot. And that's all he is. The best character in this show, the most Star Trek-like character is Doug Jones Saru. The makeup is awful, but his performance is good. He is reduced to an incompetent buffoon in this season. There is a point where he actually punishes Michael Burnham and demotes her. And this is all undercut when Michael Burnham approves of this demotion, which leads to Captain Saru promoting Tilly to first officer and eventually captain. <laughs> Even Polygon thought that was lame. When Michael is stripped of her role as first officer due to insubordination, he promotes, he being Saru, Ensign Sylvia Tilly into her position in a decision that clearly had more to do with the writers not knowing what to do with Tilly than any in-world logic. <laughs> they did try to give the rest of the crew that looks like the cast of your average insurance commercial something to do. They threw him a few lines and Dentmer, I finally remembered her name three seasons in, she's the redhead was a little stressed out about going into the future they spent two episodes leading up to the big resolution which was she needed to ask for help but most of the time they're doing the same thing they have done in star trek discovery season one and season two nod in approval of michael burnham the first part of this season was the discovery looking for the federation so after Michael Burnham bumps into her boyfriend in space and finds out about the burn. A year later, the Discovery crashes on a different planet, and we have our very first Michael Burnhamless episode, and we get to focus on the crew who bumbles around until Michael Burnham comes and saves them. Once the crew is reunited, we start all of the crying once everyone realizes they're 930 years in the future and they'll never see their family again, and they sacrificed all their lives for space Jesus, but eventually they realize it's it's space Jesus and they did the right thing. The discovery does go to earth and pick up their little virtue signal Adira and find out that the Federation has abandoned earth and that earth is isolationist and it's hoarding its dilithium from other earth colonies that earth apparently doesn't know about because they stopped communicating with people. A hundred year conflict is easily solved with a simple conversation with Michael Burnham. And that's pretty much how you can sum up the early episodes of this season. They go to the Trill home world with Adira and Michael Burnham because she has to be in absolutely everything. She easily solves the conflict with a conversation and beating up a couple of guys who are twice her size, and Adira gets her ghost boyfriend. This finally leads us to the Federation, which has been reduced to a bunch of spaceships circling another spaceship. One of those spaceships is the Voyager. Remember the Voyager? And this is where we meet two new interesting characters for Star Trek Discovery, Admiral Vance and David Cronenberg. I never learned his name and I don't care. They debrief the crew. They retrofit the Discovery. Michael Burnham disobeys a couple of orders. They go out on a mission. They're successful. They drop off Yum Yum. Yum Yum. The Discovery is now a super spaceship that is more advanced than anything a thousand years in the future. But the best retrofit for the Discovery was the detachable nacelles for maneuverability in space. Even her nacelles are now detached, improving maneuverability and enabling us to be more efficient in flight. And the sphere data from season two became sentient. 
early on in the season. That's right. A crew. Computer, run a level 10 diagnostic. I'm fully operational. The ship that had to run from an evil artificial intelligence allowed their computer to be taken over by an artificial intelligence and nobody batted an eye. The Federation is just about preserving itself. It's not about exploring anymore. And the discovery being there with a spore drive is a game changer that they literally say in this series, all the modern vernacular is there. All of the tripe storytelling is there, but we've gone over that. We also find out that the Quadrant is pretty much controlled by the Emerald Syndicate, who was run by Osira. And this is where we get to our true big bad for Series 3, Macapitalism. Don't you love it when millionaires working for billion-dollar corporations using billion-dollar franchises to make critiques of capitalism? It's almost as bad as people saying they're anti-fascist, helping usher in fascist regimes. Oh, but it doesn't end there. Back to Polygon. One plot provided a critique of colonialism, with the Emerald Chain Mercantile Syndicate providing a powerful argument in favor of the Prime Directive, Starfleet's ban on significantly interfering with alien civilizations. The Emerald Chain shows up to offer wondrous solutions to problems like environmental crises, which are contingent on their ability to exploit the resources of the planets they help. This brings us to the expiration dates that this series put on Star Trek, and we will start with the Mirror Universe. David Cronenberg tells Emperor Georgiou she's space sick. We find out that the Terran Empire has fallen. Mirror Universe is separating from this current timeline, and it's killing Emperor Georgiou, and it's fatal. Their big solution for this? Hugh Colbert asks the computer, who magically finds the Guardian of Forever. Remember better Star Trek? Remember Edith Keeler? Remember the Star Dispatch? Well, Giorgio gets sent back to the Mirror Universe and tries not to kill Mirror Michael Burnham, who's the most important thing in that universe as well. She still ends up killing Michael Burnham, but she really didn't want to, and that was good enough for Carl, who sends her off into her own spinoff show, proving that even if Alex Kurtzman and Michelle Paradise try to go 900 years into the future of established canon, they can still screw it up. They have permanently put an expiration date on the Mirror Universe. The worst episode in the worst season of Star Trek Discovery is Unification Part 3, which essentially ends the Vulcan and Romulan story. Not that I expect anything interesting from Kurtzman Trek, but you think with a name like Unification Part 3, they would try to do something other than having Michael Burnham argue with her mom in a room for an hour. The Romulans and the Vulcans live in somewhat of a peace. They have left the Federation because they thought the Federation made them responsible for the burn. That's right. They got their feelings hurt. The single most offensive thing in this episode was actually showing footage of Leonard Nimoy from Unification Part 2. So why did they give Spock a big sister? Why not just have Sinequa Martin-Green be the captain of a crew of a ship that has no connection to the original series and forge ahead with your own stories? Because the past is problematic to these hacks. It's also used as a shortcut for hacks. Alex Kurtzman and Jar Jar Abrams have built their careers on that and to attach themselves to something that was written by Harlan Ellison is probably making him spin in his grave. And the third and final thing they put an expiration date on is the Federation, which again was reduced to a bunch of spaceships circling another spaceship waiting around for Michael Burnham to come and save them. What Polygon calls a failed attempt at complex storytelling, I would call just another Star Trek Discovery plot contrivance, and it's our main arc, The Burn. Season 3's primary conflict is The Burn, a mysterious event that affected dilithium, the element responsible for faster-than-light travel and much of Trek's other wondrous technology, and left the quadrant diminished and fragmented. Dilithium was in short supply in the period immediately before and especially after the burn, leaving the Federation and various other factions only able to apply force based on their dwindling reserves. So what took out the mighty Federation, an organization built by the likes of Captain Archer, Captain Kirk, Captain Pike, Captain Picard, Captain Sisko, Captain Janeway, Ensign Rowe. 
It's made of our shit, you know. A a Kelpian who missed his mom. That's right. The cause of the burn was a stranded Kelpian who has been on a planet of dilithium inside a ship being raised by holograms for 125 years, screamed when his mom died, and it blew up every ship that was actively using dilithium. How did this happen? He was born on the planet where he was trapped, which was made out of dilithium, and his body adapted to the subspace radiation, even though the rest of his family died from it. That was it. That's the explanation. I've been working on this review for far too long. This show does not deserve this much of my time. There's a big stupid space battle at the end. There's a fierce girl fight. Michael Burnham kills the greener, friendlier capitalist Samantha B. Saru takes a leave with his new lover, Sukal, and the rest of the crew get their communist uniforms. And in Michael Burnham fashion, because she stole it from Captain Saru, she is now captain of the Discovery. I know there was a lot I didn't get to. There was no significant straight white male lead in this show. There was plenty of girl bosses. The mirror universe was a matriarchy. It was the first Star Trek to introduce segregation and there was crying. But feel free to put in the comment section every stupid thing that I missed because it was a lot. And this ends another season of CW Star Trek. Feelings in hallways, feelings in space, pronouns in space star trek discovery likes to grab the headlines because that's the only thing it can do to get attention how about this for headlines it's the third rotten star trek discovery season in a row star trek discovery is not the first star trek to deal with gender issues it's not the first star trek to have an alphabet kiss it's not the first star trek to have a black female captain but it is a first in one thing it was the first star trek to suck nerderotic.com please subscribe thanks for listening if you like what i do please like share and subscribe it really does help independent content creators and if you could do that with your favorite youtuber as well i'm sure they would appreciate it as much as i do